Welcome everyone, I am Michael. I am presenting this special release for Season 1 of Antediluvian Revelations, a poetic retelling of the book of Enoch the Prophet. This episode will be released as both a video and an audio-only podcast. While I have plans to recreate the entire series with video and audio enhancements to make the podcast more entertaining and informative than the initial release of the material as an audio-only program, I am releasing this early production version of the summary discussion of Part 1. As many of you out there already know, the original podcast series predicted the October 7, 2023 Hamas-Israel War and the increasing conflict that will eventually lead to the apocalyptic end of mankind in a global thermonuclear World War III. Including the predictions of multiple train wrecks, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions, the entire text of antediluvian revelations continues to be a prediction of many other events that have not yet happened. The poetry and discussion segments in this series have accurately predicted many events that have already occurred. The worst is yet to come. In an effort to stay current and continue to provide as much guidance as I possibly can with the time remaining, I have been working on the fourth edition of the book that I hope to release in the near future as a free download on the Polyette Lotion Publishing website. In addition to this book and others in progress, I hope to make available to the public readable PDF versions for free. There will be some books and items that may be purchased, but they are not prophetic materials the same as those that will be free because a true prophet never profits from delivering the word of God. Anyone who has claimed to be a prophet and made money from others on earth as a preacher, minister, or so-called prophet is a false prophet. All prophetic works made available from Apollo Lotion Publishing are free. Thank you for your patience. And now, here is the updated and revised fourth edition summary discussion of part one for Antediluvian Revelations, a poetic retelling of the book of Enoch the Prophet. Summary Discussion of Part 1 Initial Conflicts and Actions The title of Canto 1 is The Blessed and Accursed because the content identifies the two forces within the epic tale that are the antagonist and protagonist. The premise for the story overall is that there are two types of extraterrestrial beings, good and evil, capable of intergalactic travel. While all of these advanced species of beings, historically referred to as angels, have the capability for eternal life in order to travel from one place to another in the expanse of the universe, there is only one supreme being who is the creator for it all of it. Eloi, the Shining One, created all creatures throughout the universe, and Eloi created these eternal beings, sons of God, to watch over the creatures who had not evolved to be eternal and capable of intergalactic travel. Eloi's primary regulation for an advanced eternal species has always been that these sons of heaven were not allowed to interfere with the natural development of lesser creatures living and evolving on the many planets like Earth throughout the universe, which are capable of supporting sentient life forms not entirely unlike humanity. The conflict in this epic begins with one group of these eternal beings becoming rebellious and deciding to defy God's commandments that prohibited contact and evolutionary interference with the lesser evolved species of humanity. God created task and limited these eternal beings to have the purpose of watching, recording, and reporting the evolutionary development of ephemeral beings on habitable planets. A modern-day document providing an alternate description of this event is the Urantia Book, 1996. According to this New Age religion histoire, Earth is known to these transgressing aliens as Urantia. While the author's claim about this quasi-science fiction text is that its contents are the rambling and incoherent contributions of demonically possessed morons, the extraterrestrial sources for the information revealed in the Urantia book are the same accursed spirits described in the epic poetry. The Urantia book is a very lengthy text that even includes its own version of the New Testament Gospels with additional falsified details. Followers of the Urantia book a polytheistic theological treatise claim it is the prophetic revelation of God, but it is actually the output of a satanic cult whose priest is named Melchizedek. The Urantia book becomes very bad science fiction with Melchizedek as its key prophetic persona. The story of how a species of extraterrestrials came to the earth, Urantia, as it appears in the Urantia book, is Satan's attempt to proclaim innocence for the treasonous crime committed against God with humanity as the victim of that crime. And quite a few people have fallen into the trap of believing it, 
because the name of Melchizedek appears in Genesis chapter 14 verse 18. There is absolutely no reasonable validation for Melchizedek to appear anywhere in the Old Testament, New Testament, Book of Mormon, or even the Slavonic translation of the Book of Enoch the Prophet. And the inclusion of this character name appearing in the canonized text of the Holy Bible and other texts becomes known as the Melchizedekian Curse. The authors of the Urantia book use the Melchizedekian Curse to create a falsified premise for the science fiction tale appearing in that text, which is based on the polytheistic Catholic doctrine. The Urantia book incorporates an elaborately designed hoax through the manipulation of data and electronic records to make it seem as though the fictional story is the result of psychic communications with an extraterrestrial entity named Melchizedek in a CE5 event. All religious texts that include references to Melchizedek as being more than the name of the king of Salem contain the Melchizedekian curse. The Melchizedekian curse. There are no canonized biblical texts originating in ancient Aramaic or Hebrew that clearly explain the origin and purpose of Melchizedek as a priest because the altered details surrounding the appearance of this character are a poorly concealed attempt to curse the Holy Bible with a falsehood. It is also the case that the incorporation of Melchizedek in the Book of Mormon is another example of how a heretic prophet injected the fraudulent concept of Melchizedek as a priest into a fraudulent religious document. The entire Latter-day Saints theology is based on a fraudulent historiography not much different from the one proposed in the Urantia book. Although there will not be any further presentation of detailed analysis on the Book of Mormon, the author's study of the book resulted in rejecting that text as having fraudulent content about Melchizedek because it is based on the Slavonic Book of Enoch. As previously explained, the editorialization of an original religious text had the effect of causing that text to become cursed. The proof of editorialization in the canonized Holy Bible may be realized in a comparison of the Dead Sea Scrolls appearing in the Genesis Apocryphon Scrolls with details in Genesis chapter 14 verses 18 through 19. The Dead Sea Scroll numbered 11Q13 also proves that the inclusion of Melchizedek in Psalm 110 verse 4 related References in the text of the Synoptic Gospels and the Epistle to the Hebrews are the elaborate components of the Melchizedekian curse created during the Second Temple period and included in the early paganized revisions of the New Testament documents that became the canonized Holy Bible. A more detailed analysis of these components will appear later in this book. There are many other examples in the canonized Holy Bible which proves curses have been placed upon this book by pagan editorialization. Although it has a more recent origination than other Judeo-Christian texts, curses of paganism have also been put into the Book of Mormon. Paganism becomes defined as any practice of worshipping a false deity, and this definition includes all practices of polytheism, which claim that Jesus Christ was God, Son of God, or anything other than a man. There is only one God, and the Holy Spirit is the true form of God. In the Torah, Melchizedek was the name of the king of Salem, who was a peacemaker and a human being. Melchizedek is also the name of an angel, one of the sons of God. And this alternate entity named Melchizedek is an extraterrestrial, originating eternally spiritual entity who is the angel of peace. Jesus Christ was not equivalent to either Melchizedek. While he was a human being like the king of Salem, he was not a peacemaker who negotiated any peace between the Roman Empire and the Judean people. The Romans murdered him and continued their murderous conquest of the region. Jesus was not the Son of God because he was not an eternally spiritual entity. He was a man made of flesh and blood. The purpose of the Melchizedekian curse has been to cause confusion, especially for the unrighteous. The most prominent example of a curse in the New Testament is in the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18-25. through 25. The pagan Catholic edition of the New Testament documents included this completely scurrilous lie in the testimony of Matthew, which used Roman mythology as the basis for deification of Jesus Christ by immaculate conception. While the beginning of the gospel according to Matthew clearly delineates the genealogy of Jesus to state that he was the son of Jophus, who descended from David, what follows that truth is a complete lie of how Mary was a virgin impregnated by God who would do no such thing. The original testimony of Matthew clearly has the purpose to establish the human ancestry of Jesus Christ. But pagan Romans altered the tale and cursed the story of Christ by doing so. 
The scurrilous lie about the birth of Jesus Christ is one of the several components in the Melchizedekian curse. The purpose of the virgin lie is to propose to humanity that God sinned the same as his sons by impregnating a human female. Jesus Christ, by this premise, is fraudulently accused of being a bastard child, a half-breed, and a mamzer. The fault of the pagans who perpetrated this fraud in the New Testament is that they did not know about DNA. And the story about Jesus Christ would not have needed a genealogy creating him to King David if Joseph had not been his father by blood. The truth of Christ's birthright remains in the text, but it is besmirched with the scurrilous lie that pagan Romans editorialize into the testimonies of Matthew and John after the death of the original authors. The testimonies of Mark and Luke are both fraudulent imitations that plagiarize the original testimonies with the digital paganized details designed to support the Catholic doctrine. Today, science proves that a child's DNA comes from both the mother and father. Joseph was Yeshua's father because he descended from Joseph by blood. God is a completely spiritual entity who does not exist as flesh and blood. Therefore, God does not have mitochondrial DNA. Without flesh or blood, there is no physical manifestation for mitochondrial DNA. The editorialization of the testimonies and writings of those who follow Jesus in his lifetime does not end with this one example, and much of the New Testament content has been fabricated to support the first lie appearing in the testimony of the Apostle Matthew. Any rebuttal to this argument cannot use any of the texts of the New Testament because all of that text is suspiciously fraudulent after the first 17 verses in Matthew. A rebuttal must only utilize proof from a source outside of the corrupted text of the canonized Holy Bible. It is not possible to counter-argue truth with the completely heretical lie originating in a text that is clearly the work of heretics and pagans. Adding more dirt to an already dirty object does not make it clean. The only reasonable, acceptable use of any other information in the New Testament is to further prove its heretical editorialization by pointing out all of its inconsistencies and ignorance that are profoundly exposed by the benefit of intellectual evolution and the power of the Holy Spirit. Removing the dirt is the only way to make the object clean again. Any rebuttal must provide irrefutable evidence from a source that originates outside of the text of the canonized Holy Bible because it is heretically fraudulent. The only acceptable evidence to counter-argue the truth presented here about the birthright of Jesus Christ must come from a valid source that is not the canonized Holy Bible. The Slavonic translation of the book of Enoch the prophet contains another component of the Melchizedekian curse, which is the falsified origin of Melchizedek. Widely known as Two Enoch, this heretical text says that Melchizedek was born fully grown from the dead body of a pregnant woman. None of the details of this occurrence appear in the Ethiopic text as translated by Sir Richard Lawrence because the origin of Melchizedek was not in the Ethiopic manuscript of the Book of Enoch, the prophet. The Slavonic text of two Enoch is heretical trash, the same as most of the New Testament. The purpose for this component of the Melchizedekian curse is to substantiate the claims being made by the unidentified author of the Epistle to the Hebrews. According to the fraudulent two Enoch text, Melchizedek was born from the body of Nir's dead wife, who had become inexplicably pregnant during menopause. Nir was the non-existent brother of Noah, and this fraudulently created character does not appear in either the canonized text of Genesis in the Dead Sea Scroll fragment of the Genesis Apocryphon or the Book of Noah. A human being cannot be born fully grown from the body of a dead woman who had become inexplicably pregnant during menopause which is what appears in the blasphemously heretical Slavonic translation. A potential counter-argument to this statement is to claim that Melchizedek is not a human being, but the author will not refute that counter-argument. The Melchizedek referred to in the Dead Sea Scrolls 11Q13 was not ever born as a human being because this Melchizedek is the name of an angelic being who serves as a peacemaker in the court of God in heaven. Melchizedek is the name of the Angel of Peace. The fraudulent origin of Melchizedek as it appears in the blasphemous Slavonic translation of Enoch's prophecies is the diametrical representation of Jesus Christ being born of a virgin. Both origin stories are fraudulent mythologies. 
Melchizedek was not born of a dead human female, and the Messiah was not born of a human virgin female. The appearance of both mythologies have resulted from paganism that was not truly abolished by Leo III in the 5th century AD. Leo III merely abolished all opposition to the paganized version of the story of Christ that became the textual support for the Roman adoption of Catholicism, a fraudulent pagan theology. Neither of these two completely unnatural birth events was realistically, sensibly, or reasonably necessary to have appeared in a text associated with the origins of Judaism, a monotheistic religion. According to the translation of the Dead Sea Scroll Fragment 11Q13, God appointed Melchizedek to serve as an advocate for Satan, the fallen angels, and the spirits of their condemned offspring in the court of the Most High God on the Day of Atonement during a Jubilee year. God chooses a naturally born human being to be the Messiah who serves as the Godhead for mankind and advocate for humanity in the court of the Most High God on Judgment Day. And this matter appears in 11Q13, translated as the Messenger, which is a separate entity from Melchizedek, being described in the text of the scroll fragment. Melchizedek was not born from the body of a dead woman because Melchizedek is an angel appointed by God to represent Satan fallen watchers and the spirits of the condemned Nephilim as their advocate on Judgment Day. The angelic Melchizedek is not a priest of God Almighty, Eloi, the Shining One. God chose Yeshua the man from Nazareth to be the Messiah, and he was not a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus was the Christ, the anointed one of God, and God's prophetic liaison. He was not the Son of God, nor born of a virgin. Jesus Christ was the messenger referred to in 11Q13, and this scroll predated the advent of Jesus Christ by about 100 years, if the scientific dating information is accurate. From the perspective of how the Day of Atonement is synonymous with Day of Judgment, then the Court of Almighty God convenes during a Jubilee year on the Day of Atonement. It is on this day that God will hear all pleas for the judgment of both angels and mankind. Jesus Christ will be the advocate for all of humanity on Judgment Day, and he is the attorney for the plaintiffs in the court of Almighty God. Melchizedek is the defense attorney for the defendants, Satan, the fallen watchers, and their illegitimate offspring. God, who is the judge of both angels and man, will announce the day of judgment at a secret time, but that will most likely be the day of atonement during the 120th Jubilee. Currently, nobody can accurately state when that day will occur because only God knows. The only surviving textual support for this explanation appears in the Dead Sea Scroll Fragment 11Q13. The Roman Catholic Church does not have any of this information. There is no book of Melchizedek in biblical text because Melchizedek did not truly exist in the history of Judaism as a prophet, priest, or leader. The appearance of the king of Salem having the name of Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14 verses 18 through 19 is the true explanation of what a Melchizedek really is but heretics have altered the text to create the Melchizedekian curse. In the court of Almighty God, Melchizedek is the angel of peace. But the man named Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 through 19, was not an angel, nor was he truly a priest of God Most High. The king of Salem performed the task of Melchizedek by being the peacemaker between Abraham and the king of Sodom. The king of Salem was a human being whose name may have actually been Melchizedek, and he participated in the peace negotiations between Abraham and the king of Sodom to end the hostilities occurring in the valley of Siddam. For his actions as peacemaker, Melchizedek was honored with the title of priest of the Most High God. Melchizedekian curse results from alterations made in the canonized text that insinuated the king of Salem blessed Abraham with wine and bread because he was a priest who performed a ritualistic blessing. However, the text of the Holy Bible was editorialized during the Second Temple period to mislead people into believing this falsehood about the purpose of a Melchizedek character. The truth is that the king of Salem brought out food and drink for Abraham and his men when negotiating a peace between Abraham and the king of Sodom. The proof of this fact may be found in the Genesis Apocryphon of the Dead Sea Scrolls. The king of Salem does not bring out bread and wine to bless Abraham. He brings out food and drink for Abraham and his army of men as refreshment in a peace offering. It was Abraham who appointed Melchizedek as priest of God Most High for his peacemaking efforts along with giving him a tenth of the settlement. 
the legend of Melchizedek being a peacemaker has been perverted into a fraudulent ideology that he was a priest who conducted a ritualistic blessing with bread and wine. The Melchizedekian curse was created by pagans and heretics who wanted to combine an ancient pagan ritual of consuming bread and wine as flesh and blood into the doctrine of Catholicism. Heretics and pagans who worship Belial and false gods have used the Melchizedek passage in Genesis chapter 14 verses 18 through 19 to justify the inclusion of a sacrament into Christianity that uses bread and wine to symbolically represent the consumption of human flesh and blood, which is actually a symbolic reaffirmation of the murderous crimes committed by the Nephilim who killed and then ate the flesh and blood of human beings. The Eucharist is actually a satanic ritual commemorating the death of the Nephilim who ate the flesh and blood of all living things on earth. Christians have been tricked into thinking it was Jesus Christ who created this ritual, but it was actually a pagan ritual originating before the time of Christ. Performing this ritualistic act of symbolically consuming bread as human flesh and wine as human blood is not a covenant with Jesus Christ required for salvation. It is a pagan ritual that results in condemnation for those who profess its power to save their souls. The practice is a blasphemy. Whenever the character of Melchizedek appears in a religious text, the purpose for it has been to curse the text with a falsehood. The Melchizedekian curse is the fraudulent teaching of human sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin, commemorated by the symbolic consumption of human flesh and blood in a ritualistic sacrament. The ideology originated in pagan mythology and has been superimposed into the testimonies about Jesus Christ to trick people into falsely worshiping him as the Son of God which is paganism. There will not be any mention of the name Melchizedek in the poetic retelling of Enoch's story, but the discussion of how the use of this persona in religious texts curses those texts has been the only purpose for including it in this book. Melchizedek was not a priest of the Most High God, but the man named Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14 verses 18 through 19 was given this title for being the peacemaker between Abraham and the king of Sodom. The angel of peace appears in the poetry within Antediluvian Revelations, a poetic retelling of the book of Enoch the prophet. However, the angel Enoch refers to as the angel of peace does not have a name, the same as other angels. It may be obvious what the name of the angel of peace might actually be from the details presented in this discussion and the reason the name was excluded in the translation of the Ethiopic text. The demonstration of how the Holy Bible has been edited with pagan curses also validates the claim that it is a cursed book. The ancient form of curse in a text may have also been applied to the Book of Mormon without any of the Latter-day Saints church followers ever knowing that they had been tricked by a false prophet, the same as Catholics have been tricked by the Antichrist. It seems that the inclusion of a reference to Melchizedek is the key element to the curse that conceals the truth about Jesus Christ in several biblical texts. Jesus Christ was not the Son of God, nor the human equivalent to Melchizedek, but it has been Satan and the Antichrist who have wanted people to believe a lie about the Messiah in order to insult Almighty God. As the reader will discover by continuing to read this book, claiming that God impregnated a human female to produce a son who would become the Son of God is actually a blasphemy of God, and the pagan ideology of God impregnating a human female has been the scurrilous lie, pagans and heretics, have written into the New Testament documents in order to support the theology of the Antichrist, which is known today as Catholicism. Finally, the exclusion of Melchizedek from the Quran indicates that there has been no need to curse a text that is a curse itself in its entirety. Muslims know that Jesus Christ was not the Son of God, but they do not regard him as the Messiah because they revere Muhammad as their messianic prophet. Islam is a monotheistic religion that involves rituals of sacrifice, supernatural entities known as jinns, and only five core beliefs that do not include repentance and acceptance of the Holy Spirit. Muslims do not accept the Holy Spirit as the true form of God. This blasphemy of God is unforgivable, and Islam is a cursed religion for denying the Holy Spirit. Muslims have chosen Muhammad to be their advocate on Judgment Day, and they will have their day in court. The Treasonous Rebellion in Heaven and on earth. Descending to the earth as a group who all agreed to go along with the plan to alter the evolution of the human species, the accursed transgressing angels initiated the concept of high treason against the supreme being and considered themselves to be gods in the universe. The supreme being, God Almighty, established everything in the entire universe to have a natural 
evolutionary progression. In response to the ripple these errant extraterrestrial beings caused in the fabric of the universe, God sent to the earth his enforcers known as Elohim, the Shining Ones. These good angels abducted the seventh man from Adam in the first ever documented CE4 event as the result of Enoch's meditations and prayers, which are also known as CE5. In order to confront the transgressing angels, their offspring, and the humans who erroneously worship them as false gods, the one and only God of all the universe needed to transfigure Enoch to have everlasting life, the same as other eternal beings, so that Enoch would have the power to reprove the transgressors and the humans they tricked into worshiping them as gods. There was a serious danger in the mission God gave to Enoch because the transgressing aliens, their mutated offspring, and the humans they made to worship them as gods were all capable of simply killing a normal human being without much trouble. Enoch was an ephemeral human being by birth. He originated on earth naturally, and God chose him because he was a pure descendant from the first man God created on earth. Enoch was the first human soul whom God had made eternal with the gift of everlasting life. This event had the purpose of enabling Enoch's spirit to return to earth in a new or healed human body if his original ephemeral body ceased to function as a result of performing his task to confront the transgressors. If the transgressing aliens, their Nephilim offspring, or the humans who worshipped them killed Enoch, he would just keep coming back in another body another day because God has the power to create a human body whole from nothing. God's reasoning for transfiguring Enoch to have eternal life was very practical under the circumstances. Enoch spoke the language. He knew his way around, and his appearance was the same as other humans. The event was also a very shocking occurrence for all of the eternal creatures who witnessed it and came to know that Eloi had the ability to give any of his creations eternal life when they had not previously known this was possible. Enoch, the progenitor of the Hebrew race, became the first spacefaring human in the history of mankind. Yuri Gagarin, a Russian Orthodox Christian, was not the first spacefaring human being in history. Enoch did not die because God took him away into the heavens within a holy conveyance among the holy angels, the Elohim. See Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. Enoch's adventures are the beginning of the very first epic story of mankind that also involved travel in space. The story begins in the middle of things as stated in the introduction, so this first canto might seem a little confusing when followed by the second canto, which goes into more explanatory detail about the crime, the criminals, and the punishment. The content of this second canto is actually the beginning of the story itself and the content of the first canto actually becomes information that is tertiary to information presented in the third canto. In other words, the third canto provides more extensive details about what happened when the Elohim abducted Enoch, transfigured him to have everlasting life, took him to heaven where he was face to face with Eloi, and showed him future events upon returning him to earth. Enoch's story is the most extensive testimony of a CE4 event ever documented. The Good, Bad, and Ugly During his time among the Watchers, Enoch received the prophecy of the apocalypse occurring at the end of mankind's evolutionary cycle, and he came to know about the great deluge God directed as a corrective measure to undo the damage caused by the prohibited extraterrestrial interference on earth. The purpose of the Great Flood was not to punish mankind for sinfulness so much as it had the purpose of wiping out the Nephilim the illegitimate offspring of the alien species who interfere with the natural evolution of humanity by mating with human females. The flood was a second chance for the human species that became ill-fated from an unauthorized alien intervention. A CE6 event does not always have a positive result for a species. In fact, the outcome of the very first CE6 event in human history has been negative with the second and third intervention attempts 
not entirely able to correct the damage. With the bad aliens getting duly notified that they were eternally condemned, more flashback occurs in the narrative as it appears in those ancient documents. Canto 4 presents a great deal of information about the inner workings of the extraterrestrial spacecraft piloted by the Elohim. Enoch was not fully cognizant of what it was that he was seeing because he was viewing a technology too far advanced for a man of his time. The good alien angels could only tell him simple things about it all. The poetic retelling of this part of the story helps to make it all more understandable because modern humans are more familiar with this technology than Enoch could have ever been in his time. The narrative injects provide explanations for Enoch's experiences that are not in the original text, but the most important of all antediluvian revelations. In this fourth canto is the prophecy about the Messiah, Jesus Christ, whose appearance in history has been a third CE6 event. The good angels take Enoch to a place in the universe where he sees this tree of life, which figuratively represents a future intervention plan for humanity. This tree of life has an alternate purpose, but Enoch does not know what that is because he was antediluvian. The distant planet is a new earth in a new heaven, and this vision is the second vision of wisdom. After seeing this place as a future location for the righteous souls of mankind, the holy angels take Enoch back to his home planet where they show him the future fate of all the nations of earth. The details provided in the Ethiopic text made available to Lawrence in the early 19th century sequentially and metaphorically describe the American continents, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia, and parts of Arabia through Middle Asia. The ugly fate of these nations is within Enoch's cryptic prophecy about them. What becomes unclear is the fate of those nations north of India, except that the Garden of Eden and a Tree of Knowledge appear in this location. The precise location could be any place in Asia, from Kazakhstan to northern Siberia, or from North Korea to Belarus. The story could also be relating the original location of the Garden of Eden. If that is the case, then this passage seems to suggest that Central Asia is the location of mankind's origin, or perhaps where mankind will survive post-apocalypse and become a new species after mutation. Humanity is not likely to survive in North America, which becomes completely annihilated in global thermonuclear war. The ugliest fate of all these revealed fates appears in this last part of Canto 5, which is also a prophecy in the third vision of wisdom. This prophecy seems to be the prediction of what could occur at the beginning of the apocalypse. According to one possible interpretation, a wind that blows over the North Pole represents a preemptive strike with nuclear weapons most likely originating from the North American continent. A response to this weak and feminine slap becomes a dual nation and devastating retaliatory strike from both Russia and China. The dual gate winds blow a response that obliterates the North American continent. Afterwards, everyone is nuking everyone else from various locations all over the planet, including submarine platforms, which may be equipped with supersonic nuclear missiles and hiding on the bottom of the Atlantic along the eastern coast of the United States right now. The end of mankind happens with the Earth becoming permanently irradiated from the use of nuclear weapons in all-out World War III. The prediction of this global genocide becomes the justification for a CE6 event. This fourth and final intervention attempt does not prevent the Earth's destruction, but it was never supposed to stop what God had already determined would be the final solution. The New Testament book of Revelation foretells that the third intervention attempt to prevent the destruction of earth fails because humanity is unwilling to be peaceful and repentant. See Revelation chapter 11 verses 1 through 19. Humanity rejects the Messiah and his message by murdering the messenger and then fabricating lies that he was the son of God. The purpose of the final CE6 intervention event is not to successfully prevent the earth's destruction by global thermonuclear war purpose of this final intervention is to present to mankind an option of repentance and acceptance of God's eternal truth in order to salvage as many righteous souls among humanity as possible. The truly wicked will never repent, but the righteous will have an opportunity to know God's eternal truth before the apocalypse. Antediluvian Revelations of the Apocalypse the rest of the story might already be known from other parts of the New Testament prophecy that foretells events such as the rapture 
and the seven years of tribulation during which those who temporarily survived this final war will suffer horribly for refusing to repent of pagan idolatry. Earth becomes a dead planet after the apocalypse unless God decides to renew life upon it at some unknown time. The good news is that there will be a new heaven and a new earth for the souls of the righteous to inhabit as new creatures living to love God Almighty for the duration of their existences. While the souls of the unrighteous will perish or become eternally condemned to suffer in a chasm of fire, righteous souls will become new life elsewhere in the universe or send into heaven, returning to the Almighty Holy Spirit. The Book of Enoch the Prophet repeats these apocalyptic themes appearing in Part 1 throughout the remainder of the story with slight variations in details. There will also be additional references to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, as the Chosen One, the Son of Man, and the Son of Woman. Some of the antediluvian revelations appearing in this first part may not necessarily need to be listed completely, but there are some items worth mentioning in the summary. The transfiguration of a human soul to be eternal happened prior to this event happening to Jesus Christ, but this truth has been ignored by other scholars, theologians, and early apostles who have misinterpreted transfiguration to be proof that Jesus was the Son of God. Knowing that transfiguration is a CE4 event of spiritual empowerment is another of several antediluvian revelations. And knowing that God has done this prior to Jesus Christ helps to clarify the importance of this power that only Eloi has. God can transfigure a human soul to be eternal, but this event did not mean that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. It proved God chose a human being to perform a task on earth in support of God's interests. The CE4 event that occurred for Enoch was with the Elohim. In consideration of other reported CE4 events, it is easily arguable that Elohim have not always been involved in every known or reported CE4 event. Furthermore, these other documented CE4 events prove that there are more than one species of extraterrestrials visiting Earth, but only Eloi has the ability to transfigure a human soul to be eternal. Still, there were other reveals in the first part of the epic. The concepts of alternating current electricity for the powering of lights, nuclear reactors, which may be either fission or fusion-based power sources, the television portrayed as a frosty orb with sound coming from it, and even the projected light with sound like in a movie theater, are several examples of antediluvian revelations found within the cryptic descriptions appearing in the early English translations of the Book of Enoch, the Prophet. Such things were not known during the early 19th century or before, so the preservation of these prophecies results from a lack of anyone endeavoring to conceal or reveal them further by editorial changes or explanations until now. The reason for these things to become revealed as prophetic predictions of hidden in the ancient text might be obvious to some readers who also know that the event known as Judgment Day is approaching rapidly. The time has come for mankind to know all of these mysteries, but there is still more of the epic story remaining. The second part begins with the first of three parables, and the spell of sleeplessness might still affect some readers despite the author's effort to reveal it in advance. A cup of herbal tea that causes drowsiness might help the reader get some rest, but praising God is the solution. As previously explained in the introduction, these spells use linguistic manipulations and they are not magic because they use psycholinguistics to have a psychological effect. The release from this first spell is to willingly praise the one and only God of the universe and profess true love for Eloi, the Shining One. The modifications made in the poetic retelling should be helpful to dispel the defects of this sleeplessness smell, but the solution for release from this linguistic manipulation has been clearly stated here. The author has fairly and responsibly warned the reader to have a cup of herbal tea and to praise God. Well, that is all for this update. Be sure to subscribe for notifications of new releases. Thank you for listening. I am Michael.